Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us at the Open Source Summit Latin America. Um, I'm Corrine Wallach. I am a head of developer community at StarTree, and this is my colleague. Hi, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm a developer advocate uh, at StarTree. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so hopefully that's working, uh, Corrine. Let me just put the yes. slideshow button. So yes. Uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, real-time analytics. Uh, going beyond stream processing with Apache Pinot. Uh, so I'm going to let Kareen get us underway. Um, so just to kick it off, I'm going to start off with like uh, some basic fundamentals about real-time analytics and the trends and how, where it's changing the dynamic of businesses. So to start off, um, there are three, generally speaking, three different types of analytics use cases. You can skip to the next slide. Um, the first one is probably the most commonly known when people think of analytics is dashboards and BI tools. Um, these are often uh, used internally at organizations and they're often obsessed by BI analysts and other internal folks. You can go to the next slide. The next one is user-facing analytics. So user-facing analytics is essentially when organizations are providing their end users or their customers with their own real-time analytics. And we'll dig into this a little bit further. Um, this is probably going to be like a big chunk of the highlight of what we're going to be speaking about today. The third one is machine learning. Um, these are often uh, processed by some kind of system on the opposite end. Um, so, you know, you're bringing the real-time analytics and then there's some kind of system processing. So this could be like things like anomaly detection um, or like fraud detection that's automated by a machine, any kind of like machine learning type of powered analytics. So going into further about user-facing analytics and how it's kind of changed the dynamics of businesses over time. So back when, I don't know <laughs> what years, but um, back when it used to be that uh, organizations were primarily using analytics for internal purposes, like the BI analysts, and they still are, and it's still very, very powerful. But as time progressed, um, a lot of organizations started providing their end users with their own, own real-time analytics. And they're basically empowering their users to be able to uh, make decisions and um, read into these analytics. And so much so that this has actually transformed businesses. Like they have actually productized and created products providing their end users with real-time analytics. So there's like a lot of organizations that provide premium services where uh, you, their end users have the ability to access their own real-time analytics, um, which is really powerful. Um, the other thing that uh, the actionable insights. So Actionable insights, I think if this is really important to kind of take away, because this is kind of like where the power, like how you can empower your end users or your customers. So act actionable insights are essentially the real providing your um, end users with real-time analytics, but then allowing them to take immediate action upon gaining those insights. So uh, we could dig into this a little bit further with some examples, but Essentially, like a, a user sees something. This is action of insight slide. I wasn't sure if we had this one. So essentially, when a user gets some kind of information or insight, they have the ability to take action right away, which increases your user engagement, but also empowers your users. And this is where some of the benefits of having these premium services that provide their end users with real-time analytics or productizing it can become essentially really powerful for the users. So we'll go into some a couple use cases. Um, the first one uh, is LinkedIn. They do a lot of end user uh, real-time analytics. The first one, the most popular one that LinkedIn has, um, actually, I think the total users now at LinkedIn is like over 800 million, which is insane, but um, is who viewed my profile. So chances are most of you guys have experienced the who viewed my profile experience. Um, it does allow you to see in real time who viewed your profile, but what it also does is it allows you the ability to slice and dice this data based on like country or company and things like that. So the real-time analytics experience for the end user is uh, really dynamic, um, which increases the engagement. People love the who viewed my profile feature. Another example of the real-time analytics at LinkedIn you can click. Yeah, I mean, I guess the other thing to point out on this one is you notice it's got the little premium icon in the corner is that they've actually made a product that makes money out of the data 
that then adds on top of the the, the free version that they that everybody sees. So that's it's right. pretty cool. Like it's data they had anyway, and they're able to <laughs> package it back to you and say, hey, here's what's happening right now. And you're like, oh, that's cool. That's it's a, it's a major money maker. I think. Uh, I, I was reading somewhere, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but like I was reading that online, it said that like almost 40% or something have premium LinkedIn accounts, which is like crazy. Oh, wow. Okay. So another example of uh, real-time analytics for the end users, which is like a little bit of a twist of this, but it has like the same necessities to be able to build something like this is um, the newsfeed. So when a user goes to their homepage, they have to see relevant information, things that they haven't seen again. And ideally it's already been processed through some algorithm to make sure that it's actually relevant for them. Um, and this system has to be built with the same kind of pipelines as uh, you know, providing your end users with real-time analytics. You have to be able to take all this data in, which we'll explain how to systematize that. But that's another example of the real-time analytics. You can click again. And then the big productized real-time analytics that uh, LinkedIn does is their talent insights, their recruiter-facing products. Um, this it gives them like a big real-time look on what's going on in the market, the trends, things like that, all these insights. Now, these insights are very powerful, as you can imagine, for their end users. They'll be able to see something and they could take action on it immediately. Um, which is really, really powerful. So this is an example of a few different ways that LinkedIn has productized, um, as Mark was mentioning, the real-time analytics. Another example is Uber Eats. So Uber Eats has over 500,000 plus uh, restaurant owners. Um, and they provide these restaurant owners as part of like these premium features, their ability to access their own real-time analytics. And on their analytics, they can see missed orders, inaccurate orders, top selling items, things like that. And going back to speaking about things like the actionable insights where these end users have the ability to take action. If a restaurant owner sees that something is going wrong, there's a missed order, or like maybe there's some item feedbacks that are like very thumbs down, they have to be able to act immediately, right? They can't wait until every, all the data batch data comes in and is queryable. Like they need to know now. Um, and that experience is much more positive when you can provide them with real-time analytics, like things that are almost instantaneous. You can click to the next one. Um, another example is Stripe. I really like this use case because it's not necessarily user-facing analytics, but in terms of the components of what they need, it's very similar. So Stripe's use case is like this. They have dozens of different types of engineering teams that work on all different sides of the product. And all, a lot of this data is real time, constantly feeding in transactions and all this kind of stuff. Now they have a lot of sensitivities with this data, right? They have to have like, uh, everything has to be like accurate and it has to be like legal and compliant and secure and all these other things. But essentially you can click on the next slide and uh, the next click. Oh no, actually go back one. Sorry. I think, I thought we had another one for this slide, but we, I guess we don't have the other image for it. It doesn't matter. I can explain it. So essentially what they do is they have to take all this data that all these different engineering teams are working on. They have to be able to pull it in and then they have to provide it internally to a bunch of the different teams. So it's kind of combining this like user-facing analytics and the BI analytics kind of stuff together. Um, but, you know, their fraud detection teams, their accounting teams, their marketing teams, whatever. So like, so it's basically the, essentially like the backend teams that are really working on the functionality of the application and the people who need access to this real-time data to be able to make decisions or even if it's automated, right? Sometimes the fraud detection things can be triggers, you know, anomaly detections inside of your uh, analytics. Um, they have to be able to do this in a streamlined way and it has to be all in real time. So I, I really like this use case. I think it's a good example. So uh, let's talk about the properties of a real-time analytics system. So there are three things that you substantially need to be able to build a solid real-time analytics system. The first one is speed of ingestion. Um, this means you have to pull all your data in very, very quickly. As soon as something happens, you have to be able to pull it inside, right? And be able to like record that data. The next one is speed of queries. So even though you're pulling this data in, you also have to make it accessible to your end users in real time, right? So it's pulling it in and then also pulling it back out because you have to be able to show these analytics, right? And then the third part is you have to be able to do this at scale. So 
you have, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of users querying this real-time data at any given second, and you need to be able to pull this data up. So pull it in, pull it out, and show it at scale, like in real time, which is kind of a complex problem. Um, and we're going to talk about how to build those things. So yeah, so the so the yeah. the heart of the the system that we're going to use to demonstrate all of this are uh, Apache Pino and Apache Kafka. So those are sitting in the in the middle of the rectangle we've got there, and then you can kind of see around it, around the around the outside of the the rectangle the different properties that we've got. So obviously we've got on the left hand side you can real-time ingestion of very high dimensionality, like very wide um, column tables or lots of, lots of columns in the tables. Uh, we can get that data in very quickly. Uh, we can store it cost effectively and in a scalable way. Uh, we've got high availability on the actual data itself. And then once we've got it in, we need to be able to get it out again quickly, right? It's no good if we get it in really fast, if you then have to wait 10 seconds for the query to come back. Right. Uh, so we've got to do that quickly. And then we want to be able to have thousands of queries per second. And the reason for that is that we're going to have uh, lots of either lots of users. We're going to be building some product for the users, or there's going to be um, some sort of maybe metrics dashboard, but doing lots of queries from that dashboard, like pulling in lots of different lots of different charts at the same time. Um, so just to give a quick um, intro, like we're not going to we're going to assume you roughly know what a, what Kafka is, um, and it doesn't have to be Kafka in these systems. It pretty much can be any streaming streaming engine, um, but they generally have a producer. So someone's generating some messages and I'm gonna put them um, on to Kafka through this broker onto a topic. So a topic is like almost like a named name of some messages. So it could have like a topic for events, another topic for people, another topic for something else. Uh, and then those can be split into partitions so allowing you to scale the, the production and consumption of the messages. And so consumption is again on the other side, so that's taking those messages off. Um, and we'll be able to do those uh, in parallel as well. Kafka also has the concept of consumer groups, um, but uh, Pino doesn't actually use that concept. Uh, it has its own way of managing where exactly it's read up to uh, in the Kafka partition. Uh, and Karine's going to do a quick explanation of Pino. Oh, you got muted, did you? Yes, I did mute myself while you were talking about Kafka, sorry. Um, so I'm going to talk about what is Apache Pino. I'm like, hopefully everyone can read. They can see what's on the slide. It's what is Apache Pino. Um, so Apache Pino is an OLAP distributed data store. Essentially what it does is it gives you the ability to pull in data from a variety of different sources. So like streaming and batch, like S3. And then like, as Mark was mentioning, like you could do Kafka or PubSub or Kinesis, things like that. You can pull it into Pino. And then Pino has a bunch of like different types of very powerful indexing capabilities um, and aggregation. It allows you to like merge all this data into one consolidated view, have a lot of these powerful indexes, and then make this data quickly accessible, like in real time, to the end users at scale. Um, so it has the it has a lot of dimensionality too. So as Mark was mentioning, with like the very wide data. Um, is also like pretty important with these like complex analytical queries. Is there, oh yeah, okay. Cool, so let's just do a quick uh, run through the architecture of how this works. Uh, so starting with the ingestion side. So we've got a little Kafka in the bottom left hand corner. So it's coming in, here's lots of data coming in. And we've got a Pino controller sitting at the top that's sort of managing the whole cluster, managing everything that's going on, uh, handling any metadata, working out where stuff's gonna go. And then the ingestion goes into Pino server. So Pino servers are serving, uh, serving the data and hosting the data itself. Um, the controller will then be managing using Zookeeper as the storage layer for the metadata. It'll be keeping on track, like um, so segments are Pino's way of Pino's partitions, if you like. So they have like a segment and it will be pointing to a server. So for example, in this um, diagram, segment one is going on server one, segment two on server two and, and so on. Um, and then the, if we have set a replication factor, uh, each of those segments might then be on multiple uh, multiple servers. So if one of them went down, we'd still be able to serve it from the other one. Um, so that's the, the sort of data ingestion side. And then on the query side, uh, we have the concept of a broker. So we send our query to the broker and the broker then scatter gathers out that request to the servers that have the appropriate segments. And then it gets the results back, aggregates them together and then serves it back to the client. 
Uh, and so now we're going to have a look at a demo. So this is the architecture. So we're going to build ourselves a real-time analytics dashboard. So I guess this in, in this would be kind of an example of a, a user-facing tool. So it could be a BI uh, dashboard used internally, but the way it's designed, you could easily replace one of the components and make it a, a user-facing one. Or maybe you could even use this as a user-facing one. Uh, so the idea is we're going to have a streaming API. We're going to process that streaming API using Python. We'll put the, the messages onto Kafka. p and will then consume the messages from Kafka. And finally, we'll show how to visualize the data and query, like query, query that data um, via Streamlit. Uh, which is uh, which we'll get. We'll explain what that is when we get there. Uh, okay, so let's. Oh, actually, I've got got another slide just explaining what the data set is. Um, so the data set that we're going to use is the Wikimedia recent changes feed. So this has a continuous stream of all the stuff that's being changed on Wikimedia. So like all the pages that are being updated, all the changes being made in there, metadata store, everything is captured, uh, and those messages are published. So they actually store it internally in Kafka, and then they output it uh, over a HTTP endpoint, which uses the server-side events protocol, um, which allows you to, to stream that stuff. Uh, this is an example of what it looks like. Um, so you get an event, you get an ID, and you get a data. And the one we're particularly interested in is data. And you can see in here we've got a schema, it's got a metadata section, it's got a comment, we've got a length, and how, you know, what was the length before, what was the length after, revision, um, and some other data as well. So let's now go over to the original Visual Studio code. Uh, here we go. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to process this stream. So let's just first have copy the URL from here. So we can have a look. What does it actually look like? Um, so there we go. So that's the same as what we saw before. Right? So there's loads and loads of messages coming in. Da -da 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 -da. All the messages. Um, and you can see each one has an event, an ID, and data. And I'll just close that now so my Chrome doesn't hate me. Uh, and what we're doing in here is we're using the requests library. So we're saying, hey, I want to create a request. Uh, it's a streaming request. And then once we've got the result from that request just here, we're going to wrap it inside this set aside event client. Um, so this is, a, this is a Python library. And then it gives us an infinite stream of stuff. So we can uh, we can then just go and call our, um, call our wiki file. So we call it here, wiki.py. And there we go. So streaming, all the messages coming in. Uh, so you can see, I mean, it's the same as what we had before. So it's not, not, not any different than what you could see uh, in the browser. So there we go. We've got the messages. Next step is we want to get it into Kafka. So what we're going to do there, we're going to use this wiki to Kafka uh, file to do that. So you can see most of this, a lot of this code is the same. Um, but then we're introducing, and we're introducing a Kafka producer here, uh, which indicates where Kafka is running. So it's running locally, locally on 1992. Uh, and then we're going to loop over all the events uh, and publish them into Kafka. And every that will, that will load them into a, one of the partitions, one of Kafka's partitions. And then every 100, we're going to flush it. So if there's anything left in the queue, we're going to flush it, and then it's going to make sure it makes its way uh, to disk. Uh, now, before we run this script, we're going to create a Kafka topic. And it will actually create one for us if we don't do it. But it will create it with one partition, whereas we want to see how we can uh, how we can do it if we have multiple partitions. So there we go. We've got our... Uh, we've got our uh, topic set up, and now we can run this query here. So this is going to put data into Kafka from Wikimedia into Kafka. So there we go. We've got a hundred events, uh, and we can have a look, like how many, how many, um, how many messages are in there via like the offset, the partition offset. So you can see we've got 70, 72, 74, 78, 96. You see it's going up. Uh, we could also have a look at what the messages are if we want to. So we could, we could copy the query here. Um, so you can see here, there's the messages. They're coming in. They're really fast. <laughs> so we've got lots of messages coming in. Uh, so the next, right, so we've got, we kind of got it. We've gone, we've gone from the Wikimedia into the Python script, now into Kafka. So that's the whole middle of the application is working. Uh, so the demo is going well so far. Uh, so our next bit is, can we get that into Pino? Now, the first thing we need to do before we uh, put it into Pino is we need to create a schema. So a schema is just defining what does that table look like? It's that table that can take in high dimensionality data. We need to specify each column and then a data type for the column. So we've got an ID, we've got wiki, we've got user, title, um, and then we've got date time uh, as well. That's a timestamp. 
Um, you can also specify a type. So you can see we've got dimension fields and we've got date time fields. And those are kind of just metadata to help the, the query optimizer when it's, uh, when it's running. Um, so we've got a schema and then the schema goes with a table. Um, so you can see our tables here, it's called wiki events. Uh, we're stating that it's a real-time table and that indicates to Pino, hey, well, I'm going to be streaming data into this. So there's going to be, an, an, and it will then expect some sort of streaming config. If you don't provide it, you'll get an, an error. Uh, if we, and if we scroll down here, you can see this is the, uh, the Kafka config. So we're saying, hey, I want to connect Kafka. Kafka is running on Kafka-wiki. That's the Docker container name. Um, 1993, so 1993 is where we've got it inside Docker and 1992 outside. Uh, and then it's the wiki underscore events topic. Uh, and then the only other interesting thing in, around this bit is down here, we're saying, I want you to flush to like create a new segment every thousand rows. Now, obviously in a production app, you do it much higher. We're just doing this so that you can see, uh, see what happens. Uh, and then the other thing is we specify the schema and then we need to specify a time column name. So that's important for, for the naming of the, the segments and um, how um, Pino keeps track of what exactly is in each segment. So we need to specify a time column name as so it's going to use that. And then the last thing is we've got some um, transformer transformation functions. So those are used. So if, if all the columns in your data source, i.e. on our Kafka topic, matched up exactly with the schema names, we wouldn't have to do anything. But in this case, we've actually got some nested uh, content. So we've got a lot, like some stuff under meta. So we've got meta ID, meta stream, meta domain. And so that's what we're doing here. So we're saying here, I want to go pull out meta domain and put that in under domain. Uh, and, and the same for the other things. And then the, the last thing we're doing is the timestamp that we get from Wikimedia is in seconds, so epoch seconds. But Pino, all of its calculations assume that any timestamps are epoch milliseconds. So we do a multiply by 1000 uh, on that field. Um, so now we've gone through that, we can create the table. So we could put this command, let's go over here. Um, and we'll paste that in down here and we'll run that. And so now we can go over to the, to the browser. And if we click on the query console button here, we can see we've got a wiki events table. And at the moment we've got 45, so it's catching up, like loading in all the documents um, that were there while we were waiting. Oh, sorry, while we were, while we were, um, well, we were running that command and you can see look there's more and more documents are loaded and we could um we could even group that so we could say hey find me the oh not tell me end find the number by domain let's put in that say so, hey i want you to group by domain forward by count so send name uh, and so we could see okay look, most of the things that are being changed are on wiki data and that's their uh like metadata website. And then after that, it's Commons Wikimedia, which I think is images and then we're onto the English, uh, English Wikipedia. Uh, okay, so that's cool. So we can use this UI to do exploratory queries and that works pretty well. Um, but if we want to build an application, obviously we don't really want to be doing it through here. So what we want to do instead is we're going to look at a tool called Streamlit. Um, so Streamlit is a Python, um, web framework, I suppose, is the best uh, best way of describing it. And it allows you to write everything in only Python. Um, and then it generates a effectively like an interactive web page for you. Uh, so we've got a few different versions of this dashboard. So we'll just start with the first one. Uh, and so if we just run that streamlet run command, uh, it'll open up streamlet dashboard. So there we go. So I'll just uh, leave that on the screen at the moment. So you can kind of see at the top, We've got what they call metrics. So we've got a metric showing how many changes have been done in the last minute. And then the number below it is how many changes are done compared to the previous minutes. So like two, two like one, one, one last minute and then the one to two minutes uh, kind of before that. Uh, and then it shows the number of users who made changes and the number of domains as well. Uh, and so this is all using, if I just minimize that window there, this is all using the um, Python client. So you see we do a import from PinoDB, import connect, and then we create connection down here. Uh, and then we're running a query. So this is quite a, this is quite a, uh, a cool thing that you can do. So you can actually do a count and a filter at the same time. So we've got our big filter down here on line 21. So that's like get all the records in the last two minutes. And then we've almost got like a, uh, like another filter afterwards, say, which says, show me the stuff in the last minute and then show me the stuff in the minute before that. We do the same total number of events, the number of users who have made changes and the number of domains. 
Uh, and then it kind of just goes down the page. And so we, 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 we create a metric using this code. Um, and then the, uh, the chart is kind of just doing a slightly different query. This one is um, grouping the data by minutes. It's finding like the number of changes per minute. Uh, at the moment, if we want to see an update, we've got to manually go and refresh it. But if you make a code change, Streamlit will automatically pick it up. And obviously what we'd really like is that it should automatically refresh. And so that's, the, that's what version two does. So if we just kill this uh, and we load version two instead. So if I just come over here, change that to say version two, uh, that'll open up in the browser as well. So if I'll just come back here and show you what's the difference. So it's true that version two, there we go. So what all version two has, has some, some couple of differences. So we've got this code here. So this is like checking whether or not we are sleep it, whether we've set like an, a sleep time, like how long should it wait before it refreshes, and then whether we are auto refreshing or not. So we kind of got the state that carries uh, like between page refreshes. Um, and then down the bottom, all the way down the end, uh, we check, are we auto refreshing? If so, we're going to call this experimental rerun function. And then it will just re run the whole page down from the top, down to here, wait again, then do it again, keeps on going. And so what that what, what that allows you to, or the feature that you get, is you can see up here, last update. So 20, 29, 11, 20, 29, 14, and so it's changing. So like this is updating. Uh, and you'll notice that always the, the right-hand side is always going to be slightly, like the last minute is always going to be slightly lower um, because um, we're, we're not all the way through that minute yet. Like we're probably about 20 seconds through this minute. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's what we can do with Streamlit. Uh, and we could choose, we could choose to substitute in a different you know, dashboarding tool if we wanted. Uh, but for now, we're going to go back to the slides uh, and, and just get, sort of go through to the uh, conclusion of our talk. So just quickly run you through. So how does this work? So how, how is this data being stored? So as we, we kind of looked at like a few slides before, um, this data is being stored in segments. Uh, and so we can, uh, we can have lots of different segments uh, on a server. Uh, and, and we'll have copies of those across uh, servers. And for us, we set it that every thousand, it'll, it'll rotate to a, to a new segment. Uh, so what does the segment look like? So Pino is a column store. So all the data is stored in columns. So all the data in one column is always next to, next to each other. So all the data for country is next to each other, all the data for browser, and then so on. Um, and so that, that means that if we do um, like aggregation queries or like searching through there, um, it can, it can very, very quickly um, do those types of things uh, for, for a column. And so the, the idea is that we're not returning every column. Um, that's, the, that's the benefit of, of what happens when you're storing data by column, is that you're only really loading the data for the columns that you're interested in. Um, we can then apply indexes on top of it to make things even faster. So we can do a range index. So like a lot of these, I guess, are fairly common indexes on the database. So we can do full text uh, search, we can do JSON index. Uh, and then there's kind of a quite a cool one called the Star Tree Index, which is the, where the company where Karina and I work is, is named after. And this is a almost like a selective pre-aggregation. Uh, we'll, we'll run through that in a second as well. Um, so just the, the first, some of the more, more uh, basic ones first. So inverted indexes is the idea that we want to do a filter query to say find um, where the country is US. And so then the inverted index means we'll have some sort of like a that you can think of it as like a table. Uh, and it has each of the countries, and then it has the document IDs or the row IDs of where they are. And then it means if we look up the country, instead of having to scan the whole column, we just go, hey, country, oh, it's all these. Go and look, go and get the bounds. Uh, we've got the sorted index as well. So this one's actually automatically applied uh, by Pinot. So when, you, when, you, when, the, when a segment gets flushed, so i.e. when it reaches its uh, threshold, it gets flushed to disk, uh, it, will, uh, it will automatically uh, look at which columns are sorted and then um, or create a sorted index on them. What it means is that it puts everything that is the same as each other next to each other. So in the country one, all the values of Canada will be next to each other, all the ones of Japan, all the ones of the US. Uh, and therefore, if you have like quite a, almost like a low cardinality of values in a column, it means that you can save quite a bit of space, right? Because you can go country, Canada starts at zero, goes to 80. In Japan starts at 81, goes to 100. So we're saving ourselves having to store Japan over and over again, or US over and over again. Uh, the star tree index, this is, the, this is the quite, quite a neat one. So this is almost doing like partial pre-aggregation. So you can choose how much pre-aggregation uh, do you want. So you specify which uh, combination of fields you want to uh, pre-aggregate. And then uh, you uh, specify how many uh, rows should there be. Uh, so you can kind of get almost like a kind of a consistency of queries. So you say, I want the maximum number of rows scanned in a query to be 10,000. And so it will then build a tree. Uh, 
off these uh, almost like a random forest type thing. So going down, splitting, splitting the data. Uh, and then when it does a query, you should get roughly the same performance uh, regardless of what you do. Uh, and then sort of across the whole stack, Pino is doing optimizations to try and make things faster. So it's doing things uh, as we just talked about now. Uh, so at the data level, it's doing it when you're actually doing the filtering. It's also doing like clever optimizations at the storage level. And then of course, when the query planner is running as well, it's again trying to work out, okay, which one am I going to use? Uh, which index should I use? Which, uh, which storage facility uh, should I use? Um, and so, yeah, so hopefully we've shown you. So I, I hand over to Kareem to conclude. Um, th this is a pretty good uh, set of tools to build uh, real-time analytics applications. Yeah, that was awesome, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I mean, as the slide says, it's like, you know, uh, the combination of any kind of streaming system plus Apache Pino will help you build out um, pretty much any kind of user-facing real-time analytics um, use case. Um, we can go to the next slide, I think. Um, so just a little bit of background about Apache Pino. So Apache Pino was actually originally built at LinkedIn um, and since has been widely adopted and it is a very mature product. Um, it's used at over a hundred companies. Our community is constantly growing. I think it's, I don't know, probably 2,800 or something like that now. Um, and, you know, lots of GitHub stars, which we love. So if you are interested in giving us a GitHub star, please go and do that. <laughs> um, and also uh, in terms of performance, um, the largest uh, Pino instance is, that's currently being run, I think has, is, as at LinkedIn, um, I believe, and it has over a million events that are ingested per second um, with a uh, query query performance of two, actually, it's, this is incorrect, it's 250,000 plus queries per second um, while maintaining millisecond latency. Um, so it's highly performant um, when it comes to this um, ingestion and query with high throughput capability. Um, and then we can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so I guess that, that's the summary, right? So if you, if you take away three things uh, from the talk, I hope you've seen that real-time analytics lets us build um, these kind of real, yeah, like fast applications where the user can quickly see like what's going on. Like so in that Wikipedia one, if you were, imagine that was the Wikipedia editors and they were like, why is there suddenly like a big increase in, in people doing stuff? Or why is there suddenly a decrease? Or why are people all focusing around this one topic? This, this type of, um, tool chain would allow us to, to be able to quickly identify that and go and do something about it now, uh, rather than maybe finding out in like 10 minutes or 20 minutes time, we're like, oh, well, it's a bit too late uh, to do something about it. So that's the idea is it allows us to do some sort of action straight away. Uh, and then as Karine described on the slide before, the, whatever you use, whatever tool chain, whatever set of tools you use, you got, you need three things, right? So the data has got to be fresh. Like it comes into the streaming service. We want to get it straight away, be able to query it. Uh, we, those queries then need to be fast. They need to be like, mobile app fast, like web page refresh fast. We don't want to be waiting for like 10, uh, 10, 15 seconds for the results to come back. And then in order for lots of people to use it, they obviously have to be able to, uh, to scale. Uh, and then, yeah, Kafka and Pino is a, is a great uh, combination uh, to achieve those, uh, those things. Um, so thanks for coming to watch. Hey, Karine, I forgot to put you, put you on this slide. Yeah, so, that's okay. Uh, uh, you uh, definitely Kareen, Kareen Wallach is, uh, is Kareen's one. We've got the Linux Foundation there. If you're interested in, uh, in learning more, you can have a look at um, dev.startree.ai. We've got a bunch of recipes and guys there. Uh, and if you want to come and chat to me and Kareen, come and, uh, come and uh, join us on the Slack at sg.ai. Yes, and if you have any additional questions about Apache Pino or want to talk to some of the PMC and committers directly, um, they're there too. So, yeah, awesome. that, that wraps it up. Cool. Yeah, so thanks for coming to our talk. And uh, that's the end. Thanks. Bye.